All right. Again, thank you so much for everybody joining and good afternoon. Um, for those of you I haven't met, um, my name is Dr. Brian Jackson. I am the director of CETL, the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at Reynolds College. So it's so good to see so many uh, faculty joining our events this year. It's really great. Um, so today's session is going to focus on online best practices. And we have our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Barber, who is a professor of instructional design at Toro University. And uh, he's just going to share his wisdom. I've known Dr. Barber for a number of years. He's been one of my mentors through my personal journey. And um, just in advance, thank you for joining us. All right. Well, thank you, folks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. So I'm going to do a couple of things. I've got a couple of slides that I probably will wait until the end to do because I just want to go through and and basically walk through a couple of examples of things that I've seen that are, I guess, better or I, I think more useful from a, a student perspective. And uh, it, it's interesting because this is a, a topic that um, even if you look at like today's, actually, I'm, I, I only just came across this as I was going through my email um just before i logged in here and i thought it was kind of funny because let's see is this the right one yes yeah so just today if you follow inside higher education and you get their newsletters um, their student success update that came out today uh, the very first article was about creating stronger online course engagement. And when you actually go to it, let's see if I've already used my five free ones this month. Oh, apparently I have. So let's do it the backwards way then. Let's see if I can go into an incognito window. There we go. Success. I've got four or five left. Um, so they actually go through and give you four suggestions. And for each of the four suggestions, they give you a bunch of little steps in there. Uh, so as you can see, this is quite a, a, a timely topic uh, that folks have been uh, looking at. So um, what I'd like to do is go through and take a look at four. Or I, sorry, I've got four on my mind here now. Um, four examples, sorry, uh, several examples of some of the ones that I think are quite good. Um, so this is an example from a, a public health course that we have here. And there's a couple of things that I'm going to break down at the end that these guys do, and many of these do particularly well. But um, this is the front page of the actual item. So we use Canvas as our LMS. I'm not sure what you guys are using. Uh, Brian, I'm seeing a couple head nods. So you guys are Canvas folks as well. Perfect. Um, so as you know, you can use two sorts of ways to navigate a course. Uh, one is just the Stripe modules option, which is what the, the folks in public health do. And um, so as you can see, one of the things that they've got here is they've got it set up and broken up into little pieces. And a couple of things I like about this, note that they start off with a little introduction or a little overview. It's a page or less in terms of my scrolling ability here. Um, even when you get into the content, their content's a little bit longer, but not too horrible. Um, and they follow a predictable model for all of these. So as you can see, there's a bunch of things that they've got here to start off with. And then they've got a, a, a read section. Uh, I don't quite like the way they've divided it up too much. They've got here's your watch. Uh, read and then down here you've got your do which is a common model that you see if you think about your classroom teaching um, that's kind of the way in which we do it although we do it in kind of the opposite view uh, we actually expect the students to read something before they get to us and then we actually do something or you know we we engage with them in a way in which they are the viewers of something now they might be active or passive viewers in that and then we actually get them to do something um, even if you go back to your K-12 when you were a student, you know, you'd have to do your homework, then you watch the teacher teach, and then you do all that seat work afterwards. You know, that idea of that read, watch, do. Um, and that's a common model that you see here. And, and they do little things in here that I do like that are particularly useful. You'll see the icons are consistent. So anytime there's a watch, 
you'll see these two icons. So it attracts the student to that. So they're looking for these particular icons to find out what it is that they've got to do or what it is they've got to sequence through uh, in this particular set of instructions. And then here's obviously the, the thing that they have to do at the end of it. Um, now, there's a couple of other ways in which you can structure this. Uh, another basic way, uh, here's one, we don't quite have it fully developed out yet, but this is something we're developing it for one of our community college partners based on a new regulation that they've got. And uh, because it's an education thing, you can see we've you know kind of gone cutesy with the uh, the crowns to delineate the different uh, items that we've got here. Uh, but as you see when you go into it, and this one is a little bit different. So I mentioned a minute ago that the last one was based on a modules format. So you would go to the modules and you would see what was happening. Uh, this one is based on a page format. So right from the home page, you would just click and go from one web page to the other. You'll notice that the modules aren't even an option for students over here. So if I were looking at it, I can't go student view because we haven't published any of this yet. So um, because of that, they wouldn't see any of it. But uh, we do have all of the modules set up underneath, uh, but and that allows for the ease of navigation in it. But from a student's perspective, all they see is moving from one web page to the next web page. Um, so as you can see here, we start off again, common icons to indicate the common things. Uh, you'll see the brief introduction, uh, a, uh, a, an objective there. And then when we move into the, the content pages, we've got our watch, read, and do aspects in here. Um, and you can see that in this case, it, it's fairly um, direct, uh, easing for more of the, you know, let's keep this to a single page, because as you can see here, you know, it's basically two pages scrolled. If you were to print that, it's a single page printed, uh, particularly if you get rid of just the actual um, icon attribution down there. Um, comparing that to sort of one of the ones we just looked at as an example, Oops, I wanted to go to the next one. You can see how much scrolling I've got involved in this one. Now, one of the reasons for that you'll notice is that the reading is actually embedded into the page itself, which given the fact that it's only about a two page reading is not necessarily a bad thing for the students. If you think about if they were trying to take this offline or trying to print uh, this particularly if they're doing it offline. So I just pull up all of the content and then to save my bandwidth or because I'm using it on a cell phone or something, I'm using it through the app. I don't want to chew up all of my data. Um, all of that's right there. Whereas in this particular one, this wouldn't be pulled down automatically. I'd have to make sure I clicked it or saved it or printed it off separately. So there's some advantages to each of them, depending on what you're doing. But having said that, you can see here, I mean, that's one page, which means that's two pages, that's three pages, four pages, you know, four and a half pages of scrolling to get through that content where basically this sits all on a single page. Um, and as you can see, it's a simple Canvas navigation. So by adding in, even though the students don't see it, by adding in all of the information behind the scenes in the modules, it adds in this next button at the bottom and the previous button at the bottom. Whereas if you didn't, if you were to just create pages that were linked to each other, it wouldn't go that extra step. So by adding in the modules, even if you're not using that aspect of it, um, it allows the students to use the, uh, to advantage them in terms of the navigation for it. Um, and then basically at the end of the module, they just got little conclusion here. Um, now, those are two sort of basic ones. Uh, I want to go and show you what I think is a, this one here is a little bit more of an advanced one. Um, so this is one that I use for a doctoral class that, oh, and I should quickly put those up so I can see it on the side. So I'm putting my chat over on the side so I can um, 
if folks have questions, feel free to interrupt me, by the way, because this is largely going to be a show and tell, and I'm hoping to get through most of the show and tell by the, and I should have started off with that, um, by the uh, roughly about halfway, two thirds of the way, Mark, and then we can just chat. And as you have questions, I can um, go back and show other examples. Um, so this is a doctoral class that I taught a while ago that um, uh, uses a much more sort of detailed model. So I mentioned with the 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 cutesy one that we use the modules format to create a, a sequencing for the students. The other thing that we did was we set it up so that the students actually had to uh, go through in a predictable fashion. Um, so we were using the logic that you find in Canvas. So when you're in the modules, regardless if they're published or not, um, if you were to edit them, you can actually set it up so that you force the students to complete certain items. Um, and you can even force them to move through in a sequential way. And now in our case, we were just asking them to view all of the items as we get the assessments in there. We can go in and add in the uh, assessments. So let's see, do we have one in there? No, we don't, unfortunately. Um, so I'll get rid of that. But like if you had, say, you want to folks to participate in the discussion forum before they could move on, or you wanted them to take a quiz or submit an assignment. Uh, you can add all of those in there as requirements. And then as you, we've done here, you can set up that in order to access the next module that you have to complete the first module. Um, so it locks the system. So if you're a student coming into this, you can't just start clicking on all of these different modules you've got to do the first one first. And for courses where you've got the content sort of builds upon stuff, so in order to understand what you're doing in week eight, you have to actually learn what we did in week five, that can be a useful function. Um, now, this takes it a little bit more to the extreme. And again, this was a doc level class and a research class at that. Uh, so um, we built in much more detail in here. But um, there's a couple of things I like about this and a couple of things I don't, even though I was the one who designed it. So you'll notice when I go into the session, I've got it set up where um, all of the information is, is here in additional menu. To me, this is an extra click for a student. Um, so while it's nice and it gives a consistency, so it doesn't matter if you're in session three or if you're in you know, session eight or whatever, you get the same thing. It's still an extra click for every single student just to get started into the module. Whereas if you think about this one, I click on it, it takes me right into the introduction and outcomes, which oddly enough is actually what you get when you click on this, the introduction and the outcomes. Um, you know, so um, sometimes while it looks good and it makes sense, and if you sort of flow it out on a, a chart that, you know, having this menu item here underneath seems like a good idea. Um, not necessarily always the best in terms of, of the student experience. Um, so, but going through again, um, again, I've got this set up underneath. So you can see here at the bottom, uh, I've got my next buttons here. I can also take me back to the menu and I've added these in our manually ones done here. Um, now, one of the nice things that we did with this was when you go to the original content, um, we actually set it up where you the students had to do something in order to unlock the full content. So we would basically give them their readings initially. And then there was some activity. In most cases, it was a quiz. This particular one happens to be a discussion item. But they had to do that in order to get the full content. And depending upon what they had that week. So let me find one that's got a quiz. No, that's a discussion item as well. So, um, But you can set it up. Actually, I can show you here in the modules. Uh, you can set it up so, oh, the, the first one had a quiz, perfect, that on that quiz, they had to score at least 80% in order to be able to get access to the content. Um, so that's one of the ways in which you can gate it. And you can see I'm using the logic here again. So I indicate that students have to complete all of the requirements that they have to move through in a sequential order, which actually, if I had my time back, I wouldn't do. Um, and that in order to get access to that, um, actually, I would do it. I would just remove that item from it now that I'm thinking of it. 
um, in order to get access to it, they have to um, get an 80%. So by having them move sequentially, they can't get to this content A page until they get 80% on the quiz. Um, so what that allows is the content A page basically is where all of the content is. So here's all of, you know, the the videos that I've created for them and the little advanced organizers that I've got for them. Um, now you'll notice this one obviously scrolls a lot. Part of that's because I've got four different recordings in there. Um, but part of it is also just, I didn't say unlike these guys where they actually broke up their content into three separate pages so they could, which in theory I could have done here. Um, I could have had each of these be independent um, so that, you know, the specific readings that associated with this first lecture could be used here um, on one page and then having this one on a second page to make it a little bit shorter. Um, in my case, I was thinking of clicks for the students. So I just put, uh, I figured they would want to um, uh, scroll as opposed to uh, um, scroll as opposed to click. Um, Karen, to answer your question, I would be surprised if it didn't because um, like this here is, you can see it's in the canvas.instructure.com. So this is the free version that they make available to anybody who wants to create a free account with it. So it's not institutional in nature. So it doesn't have the institutional branding. So you'll see we don't have the logo up here like yours does or like mine does when we go into it. It doesn't have the, the colors. Uh, that your institutional one has, and they have the ability to do it in here. So when you're in your modules area, once you've got the items put into your module, all you've got to do is on the module bar, so on the gray area, um, the three dots that are over here on the right-hand side, um, if you click on that and then go edit, it'll bring up this item. So there's two things you can do in there. One is you can lock until a certain date. Um, so if you basically don't, if you set up your course in such a way that you don't want the students to have access to, or you'd prefer not the students to have access to, or you just want them to focus upon the, the current stuff and not be jumping ahead, you can set this up so that if your course is divided by weeks, that this gets locked until Sunday of that week. And then the next one gets locked until Sunday of the following week and so on and so on and so on. Um, so you can set them up like that. And I've had many courses where I've done ones like that. Um, oftentimes, um, uh, uh, courses where, um, I'm relying upon, a, actually a lot of my seminar courses where I'm relying upon a lot of discussion and, um, the, um, uh, you know, I don't want like I want folks to really focus upon the readings for that week as well as the stuff that we've done previous weeks. And I don't want them to really start getting ahead. I'll use the lock until for that. Uh, the other option that you've got is, you know, you can have it set up so that they've got to complete all or one of the requirements that you've got here. Um, you can set it up so that um, it allows them to move sequentially or however you want to do with it. Um, and that should be available on all of them. So um, with this last one over here, so again, uh, a couple of things I'll point out that are a little bit different. So you'll notice like with the, uh, the one we've created for the community college, we just provide the reading. That's all. You'll notice that with the doctoral course I had, I provided the reading, plus I gave them a little advanced organizer. So an advanced organizer is essentially like a, a comment or a little bit of text that's really just designed to prepare the student for what it is they're about to experience. So if you can imagine like, you know, you're, you're, it's the last five minutes of class in a face-to-face -face class and you're looking ahead to the next class and you're sort of going over the readings and you say, like, when you read this article, you know, the, you know, the author talks about three main things and, you know, make sure you understand those things. Or um, I can still hear my, 
uh, my high school history teacher who would always, you know, he liked the charts and the the tables and stuff. And he'd always point out like when you read the, the, the work for, you know, the homework for tonight, make sure you pay attention to that chart on page 76. Like that's the kind of thing that you'd want to put in an advanced organizer. You know, what's the main things you want the students to pay attention to? Um, Cause let's face it, you know, most of the things like in this case, the required readings for this week were two chapters in this textbook, two chapter or one chapter in this textbook, this 10 page article, and then this um, uh, speech that or paper that he gave, which if I remember correctly is about 12 pages. If we assume each of these are 20 pages, which I think is a probably on the low end, that means I gave them 85 pages of reading for this particular week. I can guarantee that not all 85 of those pages were important. Now, there were parts of each of those five things that that were important. And this is where you get that idea of providing that advanced organizer. So, um, you know, like in this one, I talk about the different types of classifications and the concept of socially responsible research. So as the student is reading through that, they're looking for the different classifications of research and specifically anything that mentions socially responsible research. That's their sort of key to look for things. And in addition to doing it with the readings, you'll notice uh, I tend to do it with the, um, the videos as well. So I'll put a little sort of, I call it an introduction, but the reality is, is it's an advanced organizer. Um, so I'm pointing out some of the main things that I, I think the students should be paying attention to in this video. Whereas again, if you look at the pared down version that we're doing for the community college, we've just put in the video in there and that's it. Now, granted, there's a big difference in the videos. This one I think is about five minutes in length. Uh, whereas this one is, let's see. 15 minutes in length. So you get a sense of, you know, the amount of investment uh, that you would have in there. So I'm probably not going to have their full attention for the full 15 minutes and 40 seconds of that. So the idea is how can I direct their attention a little bit better? Um, so in addition to, let's see, where's my menu? Item? Um, so once you get through the content, you'll see the assignments or activities are down here. Um, the last item that you have is this checklist, and I think these are really useful. Um, students actually, it's the one thing that students often tell me that they enjoy the most about, not enjoy, like the most about the course design that I have here. Um, basically, I just give them a specific, check, like, here's all of the things that you've got to do. And then in blue, and, and the introductory video that I have for the course walks them through this. These are sort of the tentative dates that you should aim for. This is when we're moving on to the next bit of stuff, you know, here in red. So in this case, it was in January of 2020. So if I look back at my calendar and you would think I'd have all these things pulled up beforehand when I did this. Um, so if the week ended on the 12th, that was a Sunday, that means the week began on the 6th. Um, so this course began on Monday, January 6th. So what I'm advising them basically is in the first three days of the course, try to get your readings done and try to get that, that quiz done in the first three days because that's going to unlock the full content. So that way you've got about half of the week to you know use the full content and to actually go and, and do the activities. Um, you can see that I suggest that as soon as you get access to the content, you basically do that right away. So that's what I'm telling you to do. So if you think about this is Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. On Thursday, I recommend you do that and then actually introduce yourself in the discussion. And the reason I recommend that on Thursday is because what's going to happen as the weeks go on is that they have to interact with each other. And I always complain about to my students uh, in my introductory videos and in my synchronous and my live classes that the one thing that annoys me more than anything else is the what I call the drive-by discussion participant. They wait until the last day or two of, of the week. They go in, they post their response, and then they go and find whatever the minimum number that the instructor has set. If it's two people that they're supposed to respond to or three people, they'll find three random comments and make three random things. And when you look at their participation for that week, basically the entire thing has been done in the span of one hour. 
So there's not that idea of engagement with the ideas that are being tossed around in the class, the using what other people are saying and, and being challenged by other people to refine your own thinking or clarify your own thinking or grow in your own thinking, um, which is also one of the reasons why I, I don't use that model with my own discussion items. Um, so if I actually, Let's see, where is my discussion? I'm going to have to email it to you, Brianna, because I don't think I've put it in the course here like I had hoped. Um, and you can share it around. But I have a rubric that I use for um, the discussions that has nothing to do with numbers. Um, so it talks about behaviors that I expect in the um, in the discussion. And so if you're getting an A, there's a list of five or six behaviors that are there. If you're in the B range, there's a list of five or six behaviors there. And it talks about the idea of, um, you know, as people comment on your initial prompt, you know, that you engage with them and that as people ask you questions or that when you ask questions of other people that you engage with uh, those individuals as they come back with you. Because the whole point of this, you know, the reality is, is if the drive-by discussion model, really all I'm asking for is an answer to a prompt and then I'm going to give you two random responses and I'd like you to respond to those as well. I could create that as a written activity and give you all the time in the world to do it. Um, and I could create all of those trite things. And, and let's face it, we've done that ourselves in our own participation in the discussion forum, because there have been times where we go in there to, you know, stir the pot or to challenge students or to take that contrarian view. So it's just a matter of doing all of those things um, in advance and then just telling the students, OK, in writing, in private, you know, submit these things somewhere in the discussion or somewhere in the assignment area. Um, if that's all your discussion has become, that's that's really all that matters. Um, let's see, what else did I want to show here? Uh, so a couple of other things that we do in the, the class that um, uh, I, I think are, are kind of, um, or a couple other tips, I guess I should say, uh, that are in here. So um, one of the things that I break a lot and I'm, I'm not very good at doing them, um, is the length of time of the video. So you'll notice like that one that um, actually from my colleague here was 15 minutes. You'll see, um, whoops, I clicked on go to YouTube with that. Um, with this one, 16 minutes. Um, you know, while it's not an hour, 11 minutes, um, while they're not hour long lectures, they're still fairly lengthy. Um, and having them as in video format, you know, is a little bit better because obviously they can pause them. Um, they can download the transcript so they don't even have to watch them. Um, you'll notice I use YouTube when I host my videos and there's both advantages and disadvantages to that. Um, the main advantage is that for the students, um, they continue to have access to the course after the course is over, or at least the video based content of it. Um, some institutions have policies that close their courses from student access after a certain period of time. Some faculty just do it themselves. Um, either way, when students leave the course or leave the institution once they finish their programming, they lose access to all of this content. Um, so one of the things that I do myself is that um, I have all of mine. Oops, that's just the image. I create all of mine on YouTube and I basically just put playlists for them so that students know that they can come back and watch all of the videos from that course in the past, uh, regardless of when they're doing it. So if they find something that is useful to them when they actually start their jobs or when they're out in the field, they still have access to that content. Now, one of the difficulties with that is because I'm not using an institutional tool. Um, while YouTube does have some um, some analytics that uh, they have. Unfortunately, it's analytics for the entire world. 
Um, so like I could go in and say, look at this particular video here and I can see the analytics for it, but I don't know if those are ones from my class. Um, in this case, it's one of my faculty development videos about how to install Zoom on something or other, because uh, I can't see the rest of the title there. Um, oh, adding Zoom to Outlook is the thing. So I don't know if these are my own faculty that are watching these. Um, I do know it's gotten a lot of uh, views, um, but my guess is, is that considering I only have a thousand students and there's only about... I think it's 125 faculty and about 200 staff at my institution. My guess is those 8,805 views largely came from people who aren't associated with Toro. Um, you know, so that's one of the, the difficulties with that. Whereas if you have an institutional tool um, and at Toro, ours is Yuja, um, that tool tends to be a little bit better uh, in terms of being able to figure out and why is mine not going anywhere? Or is just my internet slow today? Ah, oh, there we go. Um, it tends to be a little bit better in terms of, of um, providing those institutional data. So I can go and, and look at any of these videos and I can get some of the analytics of them to see, um, you know, how often they're viewed um, and the last time they reviewed. Now, this is obviously a course that was done quite some time ago. Um, yeah, summer of 21. So you're not seeing really much in the way of views right now. But if I were to... That's the video itself. Um, go back and take a look. So you can see that, you know, you're getting some views. There was five people that started it. Only one person actually made it to the 32 minute mark. Apparently that person made it right to the end, um, which is, you know, good information to know. And you can you can get a sense as to, you know, who was actually going and looking at it. Um, so, you know, institutional tools can become quite useful like that. Um, the other thing that institutional tools will offer you in most cases, um, when I upload a video here, uh, one of the things that I can ask it to do, um, and let's see, do I have a random video? Yeah, so I can go in and one of the options that I'll get is to be able to ask it for closed captioning. And most of these programs, because we're paying them, um, tend to be pretty good. They all, um, I don't know which one you guys use, uh, if it's like Kaltura or Yuja or um, I'm trying to remember some of the other ones that we looked at when we were um looking at different tools uh, but they all say that they meet ada and 503 compliance when it comes to their captioning uh whereas youtube doesn't uh, now meeting ada or 503 compliance basically means that the uh, the closed captioning that's done is at least 90 percent accurate um so i know that the independent analysis of youtube ones um, their closed captioning tends to be in the 60 to 65% range. So essentially every, on average, every third word, it's getting incorrect. Uh, whereas, you know, when you're using your institutional tools, you're getting about 95%, you know, so 19, between 18 and 19 of every 20 words is correct in terms of, of the tools that are there. Um, so just to, to, I guess, touch on, you know, some of the things that we've looked at, um, you know, so I, I didn't spend much time on looking at the videos other than where they were hosted in the length. Uh, research tells us five to eight minutes is actually the sweet spot. Uh, anything after eight minutes, you're starting to lose your students. Um, if you're thinking about ways to actually decrease the amount of time, oftentimes the introductions that we have for the stuff um, is things that you can drop. Um, getting right into the content with basically just a sentence or two to prepare the student for what it is that you're actually looking at. And this is where the written advanced organizer that you've got in the course that accompanies the video becomes quite useful because you know that that's there already and you have to make the assumption that the students are reading it, especially if you've advised them in advance that, you know, this is where they're going to get that that useful stuff up front. Um, 
and um, don't, as I'm doing right now, reading the text off the slides, let's face it, you could all read these five points on your own. It's just the points should be there to guide the um, to guide the presenter when they're doing particularly a narrated PowerPoint um, so that they are going beyond what's on the text or they are providing examples of it. Um, I know a lot of folks will say that, you know, particularly with this generation of students, that you don't want to include too much text. But the reality is, particularly for equity issues, you know, when you think about the student's ability to access the internet in various contexts, how they're accessing the internet, um, if you can present the content just as effectively in a written format as you can a video format, you have to ask yourself, why are you going the extra step and doing it through a, a video model? Um, and um, one of the things, and this is actually a good way of, of, of being able to achieve this first one here, um, breaking it up, is as you're thinking about your video, um, when you're thinking about when you walk around the classroom and you're teaching and stuff like that, oftentimes you'll do these informal checks for understanding by asking questions and and even just looking at, even sometimes they're rhetorical and you're just looking at the, the expressions in the room to see if they're confused or, or paying attention or what have you. Um, building those into your online videos where it's an opportunity for them to either stop the video or it's the actual end of one of the videos so that you have three five minute videos instead of one 15 minute video and then having them immediately following that in Canvas do something, do a little quiz on what it is you just presented or participate in the discussion based upon that. Um, always a, a useful sort of context. Um, Recording demonstrations is not a bad thing. Um, I'm an instructional technology guy, so I do a lot of that. Um, you know, click here, click here, click here kind of thing. Um, it's useful to have that for all of the functions in your course. Uh, and if you design your course um, the same year after year, once you've done them once until they update Canvas in a major way, or until you decide you want to change how you're doing things in Canvas, doing it once you should be able to use it semester after semester um there's a lot of talk about you know whether or not we should record um, both our synchronous classes but also our live classes as well um so one of the examples that i had uh, when i was just looking at my um channel here i'll be honest with you like one of these classes uh, i think it's this one the 690 uh, almost all of the videos in there were ones where I actually, it was a face-to-face -face class that I taught and I was just demoing things in the class and, and outlining and, you know, presenting content in the class. And I actually used the classroom computer to capture all of that. Um, many of us now are used to the idea of you know, capturing our synchronous classes. And all of these here are examples of capturing the, the synchronous class uh, that we had in the course. And is it done? when I go into the content for any of these, one of the things that we have in, in each of them is somewhere near the top. Um, and I say that and I pick one where we didn't have it, of course. Uh, let's see, I think I'm June 16th. Yeah, so here's the recording of our Zoom class that we had in there. And some people say that, you know, it's useful to have those. Other people, not so much. Um, you know, one of the things there's often a debate about cameras on, cameras off. Um, for the record, I'm a cameras off kind of guy. Yes, it's, it's uh, you know, not the easiest to present to a bunch of pictures or names that are on a thing. Um, but the reality is, is that I don't know your context and where you're coming from and and what's happening in your life. And we don't know that of our students. Um, you know, we don't know what we're going to see in the background of those items. We also, from an equity perspective, don't know the type of devices that they're using and whether or not, um, you know, the cameras that they have, because people say, well, they could blur their background or use a virtual background. Well, you have to have a certain level of camera to be able to do that. Uh, right off the bat. Um, and many people don't have that. Um, if they're using data over, you know, a, a broadband connection, 
Um, you know, data is expensive in certain parts of the country, particularly if they're living in rural areas. And in many cases, the data that they have is not reliable or the broadband that they have is not reliable. So by having the video on, it actually negatively impacts their ability to engage in the class because it's chewing up all of this extra bandwidth. Um, so for my purposes, like what we've got here today is perfectly acceptable. Um, and uh, one of the things I, I've, I've always thought we don't do enough of, each of you have your own professional networks. Each of you have colleagues that know more about a particular aspect of the course that you're teaching than you do. Um, you know, as an example, my while I've taught online for years in higher ed and in K-12, um, you know, and my role at Toro is actually for faculty development specifically focused around digital tools. Um, I'll be honest, my like I'm my expertise is in K-12 online learning. Um, if you were a group of K-12 teachers, I would be your guy. Um, I can guarantee you there are aspects of what I've been talking about today that Brianna knows 10 times more than I do about um, because she comes from a much, while well, a lot of her research is in K-12, she has a much stronger background in higher ed than I do. Um, you know, and we all have those people in our in our professional circles that have those and, and why we don't engage upon them, why we don't get them to jump in a Zoom session with us or, or teams or whatever and record, uh, you know, a little five minute blurb where they're talking about their very specific area of expertise. Folks that we went to school with, um, you know, I... Uh, Brianna knows this because she gets them regularly, but uh, probably about every three or four weeks, I will send a message to the 35 or 40 people that I've got that I consider my hive that uh, I ask things of that, you know, I know a little bit about, but I know somebody that I went to school with or someone that I've gotten to know at conferences over the years knows a lot more about. Um, so including those kinds of things in our um, teaching, I think is really important. Um, when it comes to documents, uh, a couple of things, and I don't think, I, I've tried to spell scannable a couple of different ways there, and I, I keep getting the red line. So, um, but make sure your PDFs are scannable. And by that, I basically mean that make sure that they're screen readable. Um, so check in Adobe to make sure they're screen readable. If they're not, they're not ADA compliant. Um, when you're looking at things that are web-based, um, aim for one printable page, no more than two, so one double-sided. Um, for handouts and stuff like that, PDFs that you're putting in there, those don't matter, obviously, because you've got readings that are going to be much longer than that. Um, try to have that consistent look and feel throughout all of your course, both in the documents and in terms of how you set it up. Um, use those um, advanced organizers that I was talking about. Um, I use them all the time. I use them with every reading. I use them with every video. Oftentimes, I'll even use them with assignments to get them um, put in there. Um, and one of the things that that I think we don't do enough of, and this is actually these last two kind of go together. Um, for those of us that have been teaching for a while, we keep adding things to our courses because we keep finding things that are new or that we didn't know about before that we think will be useful. Rarely do we take things away. Um, rarely do we actually systematically go through and look at all of the resources and say, okay, which ones are the ones that the students must go through? Like it's critical that they go through these things in order to know what they're doing. And which ones are ones that if they have a very specific interest in this area, or if they're finding it difficult to understand the topic, here's the other things that they can do. But if you already know what you're doing and you, you know, you, you don't have an interest beyond in the topic beyond just passing this course, here's the things you can skip. Um, and that's the idea of, you know, what's optional and what's required. And also the idea for every time you add things to your course, take a look to see, you know, what's things you can get rid from, you know, remove from your course. That new resource that you just added or that new reading that you just came up with, is it doing the same thing that something else in your course is already doing that you can now take away from your course uh, in there? Um, one of the things that I do like, while I don't mind all of you turning your cameras off, as a faculty member, I think it's important for the instructor to have a, a presence in the course, not just in terms of the video that you see up in the corner up there, but in terms of activity throughout the course. 
Um, so checking in through email, either through for the whole group. In my case, I send out a weekly message on Monday telling them what they've got to do. On Thursday morning, I send out a reminder message. And then on Sunday morning, I send out a final reminder that basically you know the week is coming to a close here's the things you want to make sure you've got done before the end of the semester um, type environment so um, those are you know things that uh, I'm thinking about in terms of faceless professors participating in the discussion forum the number of times I will go into a faculty member's uh, canvas course and I'll open up the discussion forum and other than the prompts themselves not seeing the the professor actually participate in the discussion at all beyond the initial prompt. Um, it blows my mind how often I see that. Um, we talked about checklists earlier. Um, this tool down here, this wave, um, it's one actually a colleague of mine, Ray Rose, um, um, attracted me to, got me to look at. Uh, basically, you plug in websites into that tool and it will go through and give you a, an ADA and 503 compliance report on them. Um, it won't do things inside of a, a, a password system. So you can't run your Canvas course through it, um, which would be lovely if you could. But what you can do is all of those websites that you link out that you want students to go and access, um, you know, according to the the, the latest uh, OCR guidelines, those things are all considered part of your course design, which means as an instructor, it's your responsibility to make sure that all of those things that you're using outside of your course are also ADA and 503 compliant. Uh, so that wave tool there um, is useful in terms of, of generating that kind of report. Um, now, I had other things that I, I wanted to or that I could talk about. Um, but looking at the time, um, we're about three quarters of the way through. So I'll pause there because I haven't seen too many questions in the uh, the, the chat box. And the couple that I have between Kevin and Brianna, they've, uh, and by the looks of it, Karen as well, I think answered one of the questions. Um, they've been on top of it, but I figured I'd stop and see if folks had additional questions. Uh, or other things that they'd like to showcase or things that they'd like to see more about or something that I didn't touch on that you were hoping to get from this? And feel free to grab the mic and say it or you can drop it in the chat either or whatever you're comfortable with. I just think sharing that rubric again that I know you're going to send is going to be really great because we've been talking just with faculty we worked with at CETL about the importance of not just counting responses for those flyby discussions, but actually doing what we can to make them more meaningful. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised it's not in the course, but I'm and I'm looking now to see if I've shared it with someone in the past because I use it all the time, but not seen it. So I will have to. Yeah, I'll have to send it to you so that you can share it with everybody. You got a comment from Nicole in the chat. I appreciate the suggestions on how to interact with the online students. Anybody else questions, comments, hiccups you have in your online classes? Because I can certainly say I bother Dr. Barber with hiccups <laughs> whenever I can. Hi, everyone. This is Nicole. Um, sorry, I'm in the bed with a back issue, so that's why I don't have my camera on. But I did want to say, <laughs> unfortunately, I made that comment about the online interaction because um, I, this is my first semester as a full-time student and I, a full-time student, full-time uh, professor. And so I have five classes, uh, basically, that I'm building. And I'm kind of falling into that place of creating the discussions and not communicating with the clients in it. So I've taken this as kind of like a kick for me to, you know, take that, make that five minutes to jump in and interact with the students. And, you know, if there are any other suggestions of like small things that we can do, especially when it comes to trying to build and interact with the students at the same time, um, I appreciate it. Well, on the, the, the jumping in with the students, actually, one of the things I would suggest is um, 
I only do that with my students for a set period of time. And I tell them that, you know, I tell them that the, you know, it's, if it's a 15 week course, which most of us probably have, because that's the standard sort of Carnegie semester, you know, three hours of instruction over 15 weeks to get your five or to get your 45 hours, which is your three credit hour course. Um, the, I to usually tell them for the first three weeks or so, I'm going to participate in the discussions at a level that I would expect you to participate to get an A, which means the first three weeks of the semester really is a, you know, a, a bit of a time consuming task for me when it comes to, you know, how much time I spend in the discussion. But after the first three weeks, I basically only comment when something is of interest to me or I see a particular student that I really want to, you know, push their thinking or challenge their thinking on something. Um, so after that first three weeks, it's not uncommon for me to go a week or two and them not see me in the discussion at all. Um, but I've modeled the behavior that I want to see from them in the initial part of the course. So that way I've set the expectation. And they also know because I, you know, I do those random comments throughout the week as I, you know, um, you know, once I get to week four, they know that I'm reading because every so often I'll comment on somebody's. In some weeks, it might be, you know, just one or two. Other weeks, it might be four or five, depending upon, you know, the way the discussion's going and that kind of thing. But um, they, you know, they can tell that I'm in there. They can sense my presence, if you will. Uh, but the first few weeks, I act like I'm a student in the course. I participate in a way that would get me an A in the course. Um, and um, I've had faculty members that that go from, you know, both extremes, ones that don't participate at all. I had one actually, um, he is, uh, he was my master's advisor, and uh, he was actually the first Canadian faculty member to teach an online course in, in Canada. And he had a habit of, he would respond to every single message that was in there. Um, so every, you know, prompt and then all the students would respond and he would respond to every one of them and they'd start commenting on each other and he would comment on every single one of them and they might respond to him and he would come so basically if the discussion form had 500 messages in there 250 of them were from the instructor um now i have no idea how he managed to do that because he taught six online courses every semester because they were on a three three load and he did an extra three because at the time um the, the the union contract that he had at the uh, that they had at the university allowed them instead of getting paid for the extra courses you could put it into a travel fund for conferences because I'm from Newfoundland Canada and if you don't know where Newfoundland Canada is we're right underneath Greenland um, which means that we've got to fly to Halifax just to get anywhere and then we're only in Halifax um, which you know is still nowhere uh, so travel is very expensive for us so that was always a unique thing for him but um you know so there's there's sort of the two extremes I, I i recommend acting like him um for the first you know couple of weeks and then giving up after that and i hope i've rambled enough for someone else to think of things um again feel free to grab the mic uh we've got about five minutes left and while um folks are thinking one of the things i will um just share with you just uh oops there we go um, if you're not familiar with the work of John Hattie uh, and Visible Learning, and let me grab the URL for that and drop it in the chat, because this is a wonderful resource. Um, so Hattie is a professor at Monash University, spent most of his career at the University of Auckland um, in New Zealand, Monash in Australia now. Uh, if you are more of a book type person, uh, these are the ones that I know I have on my bookshelf. I think there's eight or nine of them now. Um, the first two, I think the white one and the blue one are the, the better ones among. Um, what he does is he works with metasynthesis. Uh, so metasynthesis is basically taking a bunch of meta-analysis and combining them. So if you're not a research type person, basically a meta-analysis is you take all of these individual studies. Uh, so Kavanaugh 2001 is a meta-analysis. So what she did was she took the roughly dozen studies that are there that are all studying the same thing. 
and took their samples from each of them and the results from each of them and essentially combined them into one super study, if you will. So each of these, Allen and Thomas, Lieber, Martin and Rainey, McBride and Erickson and all of those, those are all individual studies. They might have, you know, dozens of students, hundreds of students, thousands of students in each of the individual ones. What Kavanaugh does is she goes and takes all of those studies and all of those participants and combines them into this one big super study. Now, what the process of metasynthesis does is it takes this super study and all of the other super studies like it and combines it again to have a, I don't know, super duper result, if you will. Um, and it generates essentially an effect size. Um, and when you're looking at effect sizes, at least for the research that they've done, um, they use this speedometer type thing. Uh, so anything that's in the red is essentially things that make you dumber. Um, anything that's in the orange are what they call developmental effects. So a person just by naturally getting a year older and a year wiser will actually move point one five. Uh, so essentially 15%, if you will, on that. Um, the average teacher, so sitting in the room of an average teacher, not a good teacher, an average teacher will actually move you 0.25. So just by sitting in the classroom of an average teacher for a year, it'll actually, you know, and getting a year older and a year wiser, those two combined will get you 0.4. So when you're looking at all of these super duper uh, effect sizes that you're looking at, what you're looking for is something that's higher than 0.4, because those are the things that are going to have a meaningful impact upon how you perform. Uh, so one of the things you'll see on the website is you'll see a list of 252 different types of things that people have studied over the years. Some of them are pedagogical strategies. Some of them are design aspects. Some of them are administrative type things uh, that they've got in there. And he goes through and looks at the effect size for all of these. So I just grabbed a screenshot of everything that was 0.7 and higher. So I think there's roughly 32 things that you can see here. And some of them are, you know, things that um, you could do as instructional strategies. Uh, you know, I'm looking at, you know, providing feedback as one of them, which is right down there at the bottom, setting up opportunities for reciprocal teaching or getting the students to teach each other, uh, providing opportunities for reflection. You can see there's at 0.75. Some of them are things that you don't have a lot of control over. Students' prior ability, their own self-efficacy, uh, which are up in the, the 0.9s there. Um, but this is a useful tool. So, um, you know, play around with that website. Uh, if you go in there and, and you're actually <coughs> looking at the website itself, um, the Hattie ranking is where I grabbed that particular list from. Um, you can see I made it bigger when I, I did mine, but you can see here's the list of all of the things. Uh, and it's useful to look at the stuff at the bottom as well. So the things that, you know, really don't have that much of meaningful impact, um, you know, I'm just looking at like student support programs at colleges don't have that much of meaningful impact, 0.12. Um, but yet, how much money do we spend on those types of things? Um, we talk about discovery-based uh, learning a lot, but you can see that's down at 0.12. Um, you know, so there's uh, a lot of things that when you look at this, and particularly when you get into the stuff that's in the red here, the stuff that actually has shown to have a negative impact upon learning based upon the research. Um, you know, now some of these, again, uh, he divides them up into the different categories that they have. And uh, when you look at his infographics, you, you can get some of the sense of the different um, types of ones. And he's been doing this for a long time. Uh, so you will often see, like, here's when there was only 132 effects that he was looking at, uh, which was from his, that's from the white book, the 2009 one. Uh, the blue book is where this longer list comes from. And we're hitting the top of the hour, so I'm going to stop there because I still didn't see anything come through in the chat in terms of additional questions. But that's one other resource that has nothing to do with online teaching and learning, but I think is just a useful instructional tool to, to look at anyway, because, you know, there may be things that you've been that's been suggested to you that 
uh, you look there and say, okay, yeah, that does have a really meaningful impact upon student learning. Maybe I should give that a shot or, you know, that's near the middle of the pack. Is there anything else there that I can um, uh, that I can look at to, you know, that might be more useful. Uh, formative assessment is one that's often near the top that I think formative evaluation, that's one we underutilize in, in higher ed a fair amount. Um, so I'll stop rambling there and turn it back to you, Brianna. Let me turn my camera on so I'm not distracting you guys. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Barber, for coming to talk to us. We greatly appreciate this and the advice. And um, as we're leaving, uh, if you all just keep your eye out for our survey, um, there'll be a survey email about today's session. We greatly appreciate your feedback at CETL and all the resources that Dr. Barber said that he would include. Um, we're going to send those to you as well. So you have those for a reference point. But thank you for joining us. As always, please reach out to CETL if you have any questions, one-on-one -on -one -to -one consultation, or even a follow-up. And I hope everybody has a fantastic Tuesday.